over here. They all went to Virginia to help their sister move. <laughs> I think they know it's Mother's Day. <laughs> Come on to Virginia now. She sent me a card. <laughs> years with a Proverbs 31 wife, amen, yeah. and my children with a Proverbs 31 mother, and I told her I wouldn't talk long, so I won't, <laughs> but uh, the songs we're going to play for you are a number of the songs that during their Bible time, things in the morning, um, uh, she, she would sing with them, and talk them, and you'll probably recognize most of them, if not all.
John. You know, John, I don't know how you get away with telling me that she's a proper 31 wife. I'm going to make some love. Yeah. <laughs> I said it to my wife once she gave me an elbow, because here's part of the verse in Proverbs 31, verse 30 says this, Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. <laughs> but a woman who loves the Lord is worthy to be praised. Amen. I didn't get that. No, my wife, I am so thankful. She's a great mother. She's not here today because she's preparing up at the other church uh, for some things for the mothers. But uh, I am so blessed to have a woman that directed our children in the ways of the Lord. For our grandchildren also, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll see our great-grandchildren. You know, the, the Bible said children are a gift from the Lord. I believe that great, or grandchildren and great-grandchildren are even a greater gift, you know, because uh, you can send them home after they have been there. And, uh, I love my grandchildren. Anyone that knows me, I'm always, uh, first thing I do, I have my iPhone in. <laughs> grandchildren and they're showing them little smiling faces and, and they can't do anything wrong you know and uh, even my son comes down on my little Paxton sometimes you know and uh, a, he doesn't do anything wrong you know I have an unconditional love I get a little taste of what a mother has for their child they have an unconditional love uh, the true love is the betterment for someone in regards with not looking at yourself in any way, meaning that you want the best for somebody, even if it depends on you uh, receiving not. And that's, isn't that what mothers are? You know, they always make sure their children uh, are clothed right, fed right, uh, they have the right shelter, even when they go without it. You know, that's what I remember about my mother. Uh, and then she would brush it off, you know. And, uh, she would have the same clothes for months or maybe years. And uh, I would never say that, but as I look back, I remember that she had the same clothes, but she would make sure that we had new sneakers for school and had new clothes for school. And she sacrificially gave <coughs> of herself that her children uh, would do well. And uh, this morning, uh, I'm going to bring us to a text in the Bible. It's found in Matthew, the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 20 and verse 20. Imagine that, 2020. That's 2020 vision. Amen. And it talks about a woman, a mother. Her name is Solomon. You don't hear much about her name. All you hear a lot is that she's the mother of John and James, the sons of Zebedee. But her name is Solomon. You'll find that through scriptures that allude back to her. And she was a worshiper of the Lord. She was a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't hear a lot about women in the Bible, do you? But just as Larry was saying, the mother of Jesus was at the cross, but so was Solomon. Solomon was at the cross also for her love for the Lord, but also for her children. You know, when Jesus called James and John, he gave them names. Anyone know who the names they called? I don't want to say it's Italian, but it's in Greek. It's uh, Bononges. Uh, which means sons of thunder, meaning they were impulsive children. <laughs> Anyone have impulsive children here? You know, they do things without thinking. You know, uh, they said to Jesus one time, you know, should we, they went into the town of Samaria and they said, should we call fire down and to burn them up? And Jesus rebuked them and said, come on, slow down, guys. And how many of our children at times run ahead and do things, you know, but a mother knows that about their children. A mother knows how to hone you in. Uh, the mother knows how to get the grinder out and take the high spots off. How about you? They, sometimes they burn to get those high spots off. Anyone here have high spots? Tell me, God, God gets the grinder out sometimes and take the high spots out in our lives. And I always say this. He loves you so much he doesn't leave you as you are. Do you know your work under construction? You know, we're, we're in... The construction field. God is the, the potter, we're the clay. He continues to mold us. And I believe He has given mothers the job of molding us too. Doesn't he? he gives the mothers that job of leading us with the right attitudes, leading us with patience, courtesy, 
having great love for others. You see, and, and we're talking about those that are the, the Proverbs 31 mothers that tend for their children. They look out for their children. They use that as their most highest priority. I believe that God imparted to all women that, that it's inherently put in them to look after their children. But we have something that came into this world called sin, and sin really is selfishness. And so without the Lord, there's that missing part of the mother that uh, they are unable to raise their children in the correct way, per se. Because we're to train a child up when they are young so that when they're old, they shall not depart from it. What is he talking about? Training a child up while they're young in the very word of God. You see, it's in the word of God. That's what the Lord had said. Pass this on from one generation to the next. These very words, these are words of life. You see, do you know there's a principle of sowing and reaping? And when you sow into your child's life the things of the word, it doesn't come back void. Hallelujah. I'm thanking God for that. You see, there's many things you could sow in your life of, of a child that that doesn't bring a good return, you see. But I'm talking to the mothers that love God and know how important it is that they exhibit the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't want to be hard on mothers this morning because mothers, you are wonderful. And as we're going to see, Salome, Salome, she was a worshiper, she was a disciple of Jesus, but guess what? She didn't get it right. She didn't get it right all the time. We're going to see in this text that she came to Jesus and asked a question she really had no right to ask, but she asked it, and Jesus even said to her, you don't know what you're asking of me. But guess what? How many make mistakes here? But I think her motives were right. Amen? You're going to see in this text that her motives was right. Who doesn't want their children next to Jesus? Amen? You know, tell me that's not a great motive. She wanted her children to sit in the right and to the left of Jesus. Why don't we read the text this morning? Uh, and then maybe we'll go back to it. Uh, if you're there with me, remember it's Matthew 20 what? 20. 20, 20. You can't miss that. <laughs> okay. And then it says, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a, third, a certain thing of him. And he said to her, What thou, uh, uh, what wilt thou? Is, is it, let me interpret that. What is it you want? <laughs> <laughs> what is it you want? Jesus said. Uh, she said unto him, A grant that these two sons of mine sit one on thy right and one on thy left in thy kingdom. I'm going to stop there for a minute. Another point about a mother is this. You notice that she didn't distinguish one child against the other. She didn't say, I want James on your right, and I want John on your left. <clears throat> See, mothers don't play favoritism. They never do. You see? There are some in the Bible that have, and you know how that worked out. You know about Rebecca, and you had... Uh, Jacob and Esau, there was a little favoritism that went on there. And some of the outcome of that would have manifested in a dysfunctional family. I love the Bible because it's full of dysfunction. You know, it reminds me of my life. <laughs> yeah. it, it reminds me of the households I've been brought up in, you know. But praise the Lord, the Bible's full of redemption. The answer, the remedy, hallelujah. So if you sit here this morning and say, oh, I had a perfect life, a perfect upbringing, my mother was perfect, why are you here? <laughs> no, we all come up short, including moms. But moms' hearts are so big that I can't even imagine the sacrifices that they want to give for their children. And then when they come to know the Lord, it even grows bigger 
because, as Joey was saying, it is the greatest comparison to the sacrificial love of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving of himself so that we would be better for it. Jesus knew no sin, but became sin for us so that through him we would have a relationship with God. He, he came and gave himself up for us. And that's the same way in Mother's Day give up of things of themselves so that we would have more. Amen? Amen. What a blessing. What an illustration. A mother that wants greatness for their children. What did Solomon want? I want my boys to sit at Jesus' right and left. She didn't play favoritism, but she wanted them close to Jesus. Now, there's some mothers out there that don't even know the Lord, but they still want their children in Sunday school or Awana's program and so on and so forth that don't even go to church because they know that being close to Jesus is the answer. They just don't know that for themselves how good it really is. They know that it is good for them. Amen? I remember preaching over uh, Sister Jean Webster's in Atlantic City. Uh, that's a, a homeless shelter where they uh, feed individuals. And women would come up to me and they would ask me, would you pray for my children? These were women that uh, some were living on the street, some were caught in prostitution, some were uh, addicted to drugs, they had no uh, affiliation with, with God per se, but something in them inherently wanted their children to know. Amen? Inherently in birth in the woman that the best thing for them is for them to know Jesus. You see? And in the world today, we have many, many voices that are drowning out the gospel message, that are drowning out the truth of God's word. And so, but there are many women that are not in the church service today, but longing really for their children to know God. Because, you know, we were all created with eternity in our hearts. Every one of us. Every one of us has a longing to know God. Just many of us don't know how to get there. You see? And uh, many of us at times may ask the wrong questions. That's okay. Our God's big enough for that. Amen? And saying with uh, Solomon here. Solomon. I don't say Solomon. Solomon. These words in the Bible sometimes are hard to get out, right? <laughs> Barungus. I thought it was Italian, but it's a Greek word. <laughs> So here we see, verse 20, Then came the mother of Zebedee's children. Do you know these two sons were in the inner circle of Jesus, amen? You don't hear much about the mother being in the inner circle. We find in, in Luke 8 that there's women that are tending to the needs of Jesus and the disciples. And they're paying out of their own coffers in their pocket. Guess who the, the, some of the women that's involved? Solomon. She's in with that. She knew that the furthering of the kingdom was the most greatest purpose there was. Not other things. That, you know, there's housework and there's things to attend to and a, and a life outside of the church. But the priority is to have God first and foremost. Amen. And why does he tell us in the word to love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your being? Why is he saying that? Because otherwise, we'll put God in a little separate chamber. When he says all of your heart, he's saying all of us. That's all of you. Not just a portion of you. There's sometimes we just want to get God and give him, you know, the spare bedroom. You know, you, you get the smallest part of the house. Or, see, he wants to come and, and rule over you. It says, be filled with the Spirit of God. You know what that means? Be filled? Be controlled by it. Many of us don't want God to come in and control us. We still want things our way. <coughs> you see? And, and a mother's job, too, is to direct a child to look to the Lord so that they surrender their will. See, that's their greatest fight, isn't it? My way or God's way? Who here has not fought with the things of God? It was once spoken like this. 
If you fight God's will or you don't accept God's will, it will break you. But if you accept God's will, it will make you. Hallelujah. <laughs> you see what I mean? It will make you the man, the woman, the child of who you are. A, a mother is to point you to Jesus. Amen? And sometimes, not verbally, even knowing uh, who Christ is, but by exhibiting the parallels of who Jesus is, sacrificial love, the patience of an unconditional love. My mother had such great patience with me, it was amazing. You know, when my brothers and my sisters, they had uh, done away with me in a sense because I was a, I was not a very, uh, I was a challenged young man, I would say, put it that way. But um, my mother always stood by my side, you see. She was always there. She was a rock to me. You know, when my brother said, I'm done with him, you know. I've done a certain things. When I first got my driver's license, I had uh, got a ticket in my brother's name once, and the ticket came in. You know, that was, those kind of things caused trouble in the household, right? <laughs> Between siblings, you know. And this was something my mother would always say, don't you children ever fight. See, a mother always wants the family together, you see. And that was so important to my mother that the children would not have dissension among each other. And she would say, when I'm not here, please don't fight with each other, you see. And that was something that was exhibited in her love because of her unconditional love of accepting things that she was challenged with. with some of you know my father, you know, was an alcoholic. And she was challenged with the things of my father. And uh, she would always have a paint a nice smile on the things were well, but she was painful inside. But she was always guarding and protecting the children from what was going on. She was, uh, she stood in the gap, you know. She was the example of Jesus and God to me because she stood in the gap of the wrath of my father, you see. And uh, he was a, an angry uh, man, and uh, he even hurt my mother at times. And uh, my mother would, uh, she would, she would um, make excuses. I remember one time she had a, uh, something on her face, and I, to this day, or this, when I look back, I know what happened. But she told me that she hit herself with a vacuum. I mean, come on, yeah. But this was my father. Uh, alcohol at the time, you know, and my mother guarded us from that. See, I'm not, I'm not here to, to, to pull my father down. I, I, I'll tell you, uh, alcoholism is uh, the sin of the heart that destroys families and causes division, and uh, there was great wrath that came through that and destruction. Um, I'm not sure where my father uh, came up at the end of, of his life. Uh, I would say this, Nothing's impossible with God. Nothing at all. And, uh, you know, God can change anyone's heart and transform an individual. I just look at myself. I once was lost, now I'm found. I was uh, on the far side of the things of God, and I was brought nigh because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, I would add this to the prayers of my mother. My mother prayed fervently for me. I remember hearing her voice one day in the other room talking with my father. And they said, what are we going to do with him? I was in the other room. What are we going to do with him? You know, I was a hard to handle individual. But it caused my mother to pray. It caused my mother to uh, believe the best for me. Now, she did not know all the right things. Just as Solomon uh, went to Jesus. And Jesus said to her, do you know, you don't know what you're asking of me. And my mother, she put me in... Uh, Catholic CCD, and I had my first Holy Communion, and my confirmation, and I learned how to recite scripture, and all those <laughs> sort of things. And see, she was giving me what she has been given. She didn't know the full parameters of things. Just as Solomon doesn't know the full parameters, Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking of me. In verse 22, uh, Jesus answered and said, you know uh, not what you have asked. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? 
And what was he talking about? The baptism that he was going to go through. The baptism of death. The wrath of God being poured on him. And do you know what? They said in that verse at the end, they say unto him, we are able. We are able. They were getting prepared. And I want to tell you, James and John. James was the first martyr in the church. James in Acts 12, he was beheaded by Herod. That's this James. And John, the beloved, he went on to be uh, exiled unto Patmos. But history tells us that he was boiled in oil for his faith. He, he suffered under the, the, the wrath of man for the purpose of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do I say that? They were imparted at a very, I would say, age here. I'm not sure the age of John was uh, maybe the age of 17, 18, some may say. And that would be young for seven. That he was equipped for the latter days of his life to stand the test. That all of us need to stand. Amen. Do you know that we see in the scriptures, you can look this up, 1 Timothy 3, 12. Anyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus shall be persecuted. Shall be persecuted. Meaning will suffer one uh, form of persecution than the other for believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And as you know, as a Christian, as the days are getting latter here, we call these the latter days. The persecution is getting more intense. Now, we don't suffer it that much here in America as they are suffering in third world countries. They are putting the 70 to 90,000 people, if I'm getting the statistics right, per day of Christians that are going to death because of their faith. No, Pastor, can that be? Can that happen? Really? Could it ever happen in America? I thank God for the president we have right now. I thank God it looks like some things are going in another direction. Some of the censorship is getting removed and, and so on and so forth. But how many know that that could turn tides in a moment? In a moment's time. But we want to be sure of our faith and the foundations that were given to us through Christ, but the mothers that were given to us also. You know, the baptism that he's talking about there was the cross. And the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ was the entrance fee for you and I to go to heaven. You see, if he never went to the cross, there's no heaven for us. We ought to be well thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of our sins. We ought to be well thankful for where we sit today and the people God has put in our lives, especially mothers. There's something to do with having an attitude of gratitude. Do you know when you have a, a heart of thanksgiving that we are able to see clearly when our cups are half empty, life is very obscure. If your cup is half full, you see a little clearer. But if your cup is overflowing, we have Matthew 20, 20. We see very good. Everyone that is here this morning, I want to thank you. Thank you for making a step and an effort to celebrate Mother's Day, but to be here to celebrate the Father's Day, the one who loved us, the one who gave us mother. To be thankful for that. We are growing together as a church, as a people. The process and principle of sowing and reaping. 
what you sow today will be reaped or reap in the future. Have vision, have eyes like Salome. She didn't see, see completely, but she had vision of a future. Jesus told them about a future. If you read from chapter 18 and 19, he was telling them that he was going to Jerusalem. He was going to be crucified. And on the third day, he was going to be raised again. And he said he was going to impart to his disciples as judges. And they were going to sit on 12 thrones, judging Israel. That is where they got this idea of, let me get on your right and get on your left. We don't know completely what they were thinking. But I think it was a great purpose of a mother wanting their child next to Jesus, next to greatness. How could you fault a mother for that? You can't. Even though she didn't know him in fullness, even though we don't know in fullness, we know in part. One day we fully know, right Joe? Praise the Lord. And when we see him, we're going to be like him. Isn't that a wonderful thing? We're going to be like Christ. See, God the potter, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and then the sequence in the Bible is the father, the mother, the children. But I think that that mother has a special place in that level of sequence. I think she has her hand in the clay somehow, molding and twisting, forming our lives. My mother sure did for me. My mother sure exhibited the Lord Jesus Christ in many ways that I know more today than I did know then. See? And I'm thankful for that. We keep growing, keep being thankful. Your eyes will keep being open. Let me tell you this. If we're ungrateful in any parts of things, your eyes shut down. You can't see clearly, friends. Keep an attitude of gratitude. You'll get a pep in your step. Be blessed today. Happy Mother's Day. We go on together. Growing by the grace of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you.